I'd like to introduce the speaker, David Pettijohn, who will be speaking on LADWP Water Resources and Drought Response. He is Director of Water Resources and oversees numerous water programs, such as water conservation, recycled water, under, not undergrowth, sorry, stormwater capture and groundwater. He has a Master of Science and Bachelor of Science in Civil Engineering from the University of Arizona and is a registered professional engineer. Please welcome David Pettijohn. Well, I'd like to thank you all for coming to the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power today. I'm David Pettijohn, I'm the Director of Water Resources, and this presentation is going to cover some of what LADWP is planning to do for the future of LA's water supply and water supply reliability. So you'll see some about our efficiency efforts and various uh, programs that uh, I'm going to present to you today. So what you see on this next slide is uh, essentially our service territory. So you see there's several different areas in the city. We've got a valley area, a metro area, a west side area, and a harbor area. And those colored areas are within the boundaries of the city of Los Angeles. That's our entire service territory. It covers 469 square miles. And we provide water and power to approximately 4 million people every day. So over 491 million gallons of water are delivered every day. And that equates to 550,000 acre feet of water every year. So uh, we talk in terms of acre feet of water pretty regularly in the water business. And so an acre foot of water is enough water to cover a football field one foot deep. And that's enough water to serve three single family residential households for, three, for an entire year. So three households for a year with an acre foot of water. This gives you a feel for some of our water system infrastructure, how big this water system is. These are our 2013-14 uh, fiscal year statistics. You can see that we have almost 700,000 service connections that we serve each year and about 7,260 miles of distribution main, and that doesn't even include our LA aqueduct system. So we've got enough pipe to stretch from here all the way across the country, back and almost all the way to the East Coast again. So it's a huge system, very expansive, uh, a lot to maintain. This is a statewide water system. So this is where the department um, gets a lot of its water uh, from other parts of the state. Uh, we meet our water supply needs through a very diverse portfolio of water supplies. About 87% of the city's water is imported from over hundreds of miles away. Uh, what you see here is the Colorado River Aqueduct out to the right. Uh, you also see our LA Aqueduct system and then the State Water Project, which brings water through the California Aqueduct from the confluence of the Sacramento and San Joaquin Rivers uh, up in Northern California. And then locally we have our own groundwater system. We also have storm water, recycled water, and we do quite a bit of conservation and I'll talk about those uh, in more depth here in a minute. On this slide, you see essentially rainfall and stovefall equals runoff. Now, that might seem fairly obvious to, to you, but it's a very important thing. Uh, the snowpack and the rainfall that forms that snowpack is the biggest reservoir in the state of California. We have a lot of reservoirs. People don't think about the snowpack on the mountains as a reservoir, but that is actually the biggest reservoir we have, and it's a natural reservoir where the water accumulates there in the wintertime when you don't need it, and then the summertime when it gets hot and water demands go up, that natural melting of that water, that snow, brings that water into the urban areas. If we don't get that rainfall and that snowpack, we enter into a drought, and that's what we've been involved in the last few years. This next slide uh, gives you a feel for what the problems in the state of California are. About two-thirds of our water supply comes from the north, but about two-thirds of the people live in the south. So you have this north-south uh, problem of getting the water resources from the northern part of the state to the southern part of the state. And that's really why the State Water Project was built. We've got about 39 million residents in the state of California, about 10% of that entire state population lives right here inside the city of Los Angeles. So this water uh, imbalance does create water supply challenges and uh, that makes our imports much more susceptible to droughts in the state of California. And as I mentioned, we've been in a drought for quite a few years. This is essentially the February 2016 U.S. Drought Monitor Map. This is produced jointly by the National Drought Mitigation Center 
the United States Department of Agriculture and uh, the Nash, Na National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, better known as NOAA. And you can see that most of the state is covered in this dark orange color, and that is an exceptional category for drought. That's the highest drought category. Uh, and you can see that it covers most of the state of California. So this is one of the worst droughts on record. Uh, it's about the worst one we've had in the last 100 years. So uh, you can see that during this drought, we've experienced the, uh, the driest year on record, some of the lowest run runoff that we've experienced on record, our, some of our highest temperatures on record have occurred during this drought, and our lowest statewide snowpack has also occurred during this drought. On the left, you see essentially our reliance on our uh, metropolitan water district in dry years. So you can see on the left is uh, our portfolio of our water supplies. We've got the blue, which is the LA Aqueduct supplies, and we've got a small sliver of recycled water there that's purple. Our local groundwater is an orange. And then you see that huge swath of uh, called MWD. Well, the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California is the large wholesale water provider that provides water not only to the city of Los Angeles, but to the six county area from Ventura to the Mexican border. And the Metropolitan Water District uh, brings water in through the Colorado River Aqueduct, and they also own about 50% of the state water project contract. So they have entitlements to about half of the water from the state water project. In a dry year, on the right-hand side, our dependence upon the Metropolitan Water District goes up dramatically. Uh, this past year, we were buying over 70% of the city's water from the Metropolitan Water District. And this really just highlights the need for us to develop new local resources in the city of California, in the city of Los Angeles, and I'll, I'll show you what we're gonna be doing that, on that here in a minute. But uh, the question that a lot of people have asked me is, is this the beginning of a prolonged drought? And um, this uh, report you see is something that was released in February of 2015 by the Department of Water Resources. And what it showed was that there are some modern droughts, but they don't really measure up to what some of the historical droughts have been. So we've had some pretty nasty droughts in recent memory. Uh, the drought of 1929 to 1934, that was a six-year drought, pretty severe drought. Uh, the two-year drought of 76-77, and then the six-year drought of 87 to 92, and then, of course, the current four-year drought. But uh, the studies show, and they've done a lot of tree ring data studies and other studies show that there have been some uh, droughts that have occurred in the course of history that are far beyond our modern notion of a drought. So during the past thousand years, there were droughts that lasted several decades in a row. And then there are others that have been categories categorized as mega droughts, and the two uh, most severe mega droughts uh, are circled here in orange, and uh, they were two 200 year long droughts. And they started in eight, the year 850 AD, and they ended in the 1300s. So it's unclear whether the current drought that we're in is just the beginning of one of these longer term droughts, or if it's gonna be a, a shorter term drought. And we, ju we just don't know that now, but there is always that uh, possibility. The Los Angeles Aqueduct, here's some of the hydrologic conditions on the Los Angeles Aqueduct. The red is this year. Um, the blue line above that red line is what uh, the last El Nino produced. So what this shows is just the buildup of snowpack in the eastern Sierra Mountains that feeds the Los Angeles Aqueduct. So you can see that uh, we're not doing too bad. That dark black line is the historical average, so we're slightly above the historical average. We're a little below where the last El Nino effect was in the Eastern Sierra. But the water year isn't over. Uh, we've got until April 1st to where we may have some additional water supplies and we're still hopeful about that. What you see here is the statewide uh, Northern Sierra snowpack. You know, I mentioned that most of the water comes from the north and uh, this is a picture of what that Northern uh, Sierra snowpack is that feeds the state water project system. So the shaded blue is the historical average. Uh, the yellow line is current, that's about 23 inches of water content, and the orange is the last El Nino, and you see that pre produced an awful lot of snow in the last El Nino. We're, we're still tracking, uh, but we don't know if that's gonna level off or if it's gonna continue to go up, so there's, the jury is still kind of out on the El Nino, but right now we're about 111% above normal snowpack for this time of year in the uh, Northern Sierra. 
So this is the Colorado River Basin. This is the other large aqueduct system that feeds Southern California and the city of Los Angeles. And you can see the yellow line is current and that shaded blue area is average. Uh, the, again, the orange dotted line that goes up to that high peak, that was the last time we had an El Nino. And you can see we're tracking above normal, but uh, again, we're still, it's still too early to tell whether this will be a really good year uh, on the Colorado. But uh, the Colorado River Basin storage is really the main storage for uh, not only Southern California, but for the seven basin states of the Southwest. And right now that storage of Lake Mead and Lake Powell is uh, about 50% of uh, capacity. So it's, it's been drawn down quite a bit and uh, we've been in danger of having a shortage on the Colorado River for the first time in its history. I mentioned the Metropolitan Water District, our wholesale water provider. This gives you a feel for how much water they've had in storage over the past decade. And you can see back in 2006 when that drought first started, the region had about 2.2 million acre feet in storage and it drew that water, about half that water out before the drought ended in 2009. Uh, over the next several years, it built uh, the storage back up to where in 2012, we had more water in storage in the Southern California wholesale system than we ever had in our entire history. We had 2.7 million acre feet of water in that storage. But we've been making dramatic draws on that storage during this drought. And you can see between 2013 and 14, we drew out over a million acre feet of water. That's a huge draw in storage. Right now we have less than an acre, a million acre feet left in that storage, so um, storage levels are getting fairly, fairly critical. And because of that, the Metropolitan Water District has told all of its wholesale uh, customers that they have to reduce their demands by 15%. So they have what they call, refer to as a level three allocation. The city of Los Angeles has been uh, in compliance with that, and we've been able to manage within our allocation of, from the Metropolitan Water District. So. Um, this is how Southern California has been able to sustain such a long-term drought. You know, you hear this four-year drought, but uh, we still have water supplies. Well, what has occurred is starting in the 1990s, after that drought of the early 90s, we went on a program to build storage in Southern California, and we've built up our storage to where now we have about six million acre feet of storage capacity available in Southern California. Unfortunately, there's only about 900,000 acre feet left in that storage. But what you see here is one of the largest service reservoirs in Southern California, that's Diamond Valley Lake. It holds about 810,000 acre feet of water. The state and uh, local government has got involved in the drought. Uh, the mayor in particular has uh, issued executive directives uh, to reduce water use by 20% in the city by 2017. And we've been tracking to do just that. Uh, the mayor has also issued a city sustainability plan, and that calls for further reductions in gallons per person per day use in the city. And also it requires us to reduce our purchases of water from our wholesale water provider by 50% by the year 2025. And one more goal that's in that plan is to source locally half of the city's water supply by 2035. So those are some pretty, uh, aggressive goals and we've been on track to meet those goals and we're developing plans now uh, to comply with those goals and currently we have uh, an urban water management plan draft, uh, the 2015 draft. If you're interested in commenting on that draft, it's out for comment right now and you can get to that draft report at ladwp.com forward slash uwmp. Here's some of the things that we've been doing in Los Angeles during this drought. We've been putting uh, watering restrictions on. Right now you may know that you can only water outdoors three days a week, but we also have a long list of prohibited uses in the city, which we do enforce. Uh, I'm just showing you some pictures of some prohibited uses. This is, an ex is not an example of what you should do. This is an example of what you should not do. Uh, we don't allow people to wash down driveways or sidewalks with uh, hoses. We don't allow you to over-irrigate your property to where the water is running off. Uh, if you're going to use a hose, you have to have a shutoff nozzle on it. Uh, we don't allow water in decorative fountains unless it's uh, recirculating water. And those are just some of the prohibited uses. There are others as well. So I've been talking a lot about the success of our water conservation program. This is a historical histogram that shows you just how successful we've been. On the far left, uh, you'd see 1970. In 1970, the city of Los Angeles used almost 600,000 acre feet of water every year. 
At that time, we had less than 3 million people living in the city of Los Angeles, 2.83 million. You go all the way to the right to 2015, there are almost 4 million people, almost um, uh, f f over a million more people living in the city of Los Angeles. And look at the, ma the amount of water we use. It's down to 505. So we're using quite a bit less water today than we did in 1970, and we've got over a million more people living here. Well, how did we do that? Well, we did it with uh, water conservation. You see in that little square there, we're down to where people are using a very small amount of water each day, and I'll talk more about that here in a few minutes. Uh, this is another way that we've accomplished these goals. We've been pretty aggressive in passing city ordinances in the city, uh, plumbing retrofit ordinances. One of the ones that uh, is really progressive is a retrofit on resale ordinance, where we require you to retrofit your home before you sell it with efficient water using devices. And we have, of course, plumbing codes and other ordinances in place. And then we have an emergency drought uh, ordinance that is currently in place that mandates uh, restrictions in the number of days of watering. Uh, this is how we enforce these ordinances. You know, it's one thing to have ordinances, and it's another thing to enforce the ordinance and make sure people comply. So we do have what we refer to as our Water Conservation Response Unit, and you see some of our response unit team members here. Uh, these uh, guys work full-time at enforcing the ordinance. We have some uh, cars that are wrapped. Uh, those are our patrol cars. If you see those uh, stopped out in front of your home, you've got a problem. Uh, but what we found is, uh, as far as uh, enforcement statistics, we found that uh, almost all the people that we contact will comply if we, if we uh, talk to them. So we have a, a, a kind of an educational approach to people at first. It's very rare that we have to issue actual monetary fines. Most people are eager to comply. They just need to be told uh, how they can come into compliance. And in that vein, we have quite an aggressive media campaign to uh, educate people on how they can uh, stay in compliance with the ordinance and do things uh, progressively to uh, conserve water. You might have seen some of these bus tails and bus benches and uh, bus shelter uh, media ads. We also have uh, Facebook and Twitter feeds. We also advertise in newspapers. We have radio spots. If you go to a movie theater, you might see one of our spots in the movie theater. And then we also have television ads that we do. So I've uh, been very effective during this drought. If you see people who are wasting water, we have ways that you can report that. Uh, you can always email us at waterwaste at ladwp.com. We also have a phone number you can call, 1-800-DIAL-DWP, and report water waste. And then we've partnered with the city to create uh, a website, uh, my LA311 website and phone app where you can report water waste. So we get, this is how we get all of our uh, water waste reports that the, uh, the patrolmen that I showed you before go out and inspect. So let's say you want to do the right thing in your home. We incentivize you to do that. So we, uh, we have not just a, an enforcement mechanism and ordinances, but we also offer incentives for you to comply with that and to bring your water use down and to save you water and to save you money uh, on your water bill and to reduce the cost of the various devices. And up here we have, you see some of the devices we offer. We, some of them cost money and we offer uh, rebates and incentives to do those. And others we offer for free. So you can get from us free shower heads, free faucet aerators, uh, free pre-rinse pre -rinse spray nozzles uh, for your home and business. And we offer pretty, in, pretty uh, good incentives on most things. One of the things we're most proud of uh, is our turf removal program. We're one of the only cities in Southern California still offering turf rebates. We'll give you $1.75 for every square foot. We've also removed over 27 million square feet of turf. That's over half the governor's goal for the entire state. His goal for the entire state was 50 million square feet. Just the city of LA alone, 27 million square feet. So we're pretty proud of that. A new rebate we've just started back in November here was a 400 rebate for a cistern. So if you want to put a cistern on your property, we'll incentivize you to do that. This is how the Los Angelinos have performed uh, over time. You look in the far left, you see that large blue line. That's uh, at the very top says 187. That means that in 1986-87, every person in the city of, of Los Angeles was using, on average, 187 gallons of water a day. If you go to where we are now, you look all the way over there to December 2015, we're down to 107. And the mayor's uh, goal was 111, but we beat that goal. We're down to 107. And we're on track to meet 
uh, the mayor's 20% reduction, uh, getting it down to 104. That's incredible for a city as large as Los Angeles because this is the all-in number. This includes residential, commercial, industrial uses, all rolled in and divided by the number of people who live in Los Angeles. So it's, it's an all-in number, and uh, it's one of the best, if not the best, for any large city in the entire United States. So the current dry year supplies, you may say, well, you know, with all that drought, uh, is there enough water to meet our demands? Well, thankfully, we're meeting these uh, targets that have been set for us by the mayor and the governor. Uh, the mayor's uh, directive has said, said that the city's got to get its total water use down to 185,000 acre feet a year. The governor's executive order is, wants us down at 474,000 acre feet a year. And this gives you a feel for how we're going to meet that. And you can see a buildup of supplies. We have uh, recycled water, local groundwater, LA Aqueduct supplies. And then the 334,000 acre feet MWD, that's our allocation. So that, that includes that 15% cut in our wholesale demand that MET has put on us. So we can live within our cut from our wholesale water provider and still meet the city's demands. Some of the long-term challenges, you know, I've mentioned drought, uh, that is a challenge, but there are many other challenges that relate to the water supply uh, for the city and for the state. Uh, climate change uh, on the upper left, as I mentioned, you know, the biggest uh, reservoir we have is our snowpack, but as climate changes and more of that rainfall comes with rain and, and less snow, you lose that. That's a challenge. Uh, seismic risk, uh, a lot of people don't know that the state water project delivers water out of the delta yeah, Delta is for essentially uh, a formation that is uh, artificial. There's a lot of levees, man-made levees. Those levees are subject to liquefaction under an earthquake. And if there was a large earthquake in the Delta, it would shut down the state water project for an extended period of time. Uh, there's also uh, in the Delta a lot of fish species that uh, have water requirements and uh, there's a competition between uh, the fish that need the water and there are many times where the pumps that export the water gets shut down because uh, of fish needs and fishery needs. Uh, local water supplies, we have challenges locally. We want to develop more local water supplies, but we have some contamination problems, especially in our large San Fernando groundwater basin that we have to address. Uh, the LA Aqueduct, uh, you may not know, but uh, over time we've reallocated about half the LA Aqueduct to environmental enhancement in the Owens Valley. Uh, one of those enhancements is the uh, Owens Dry Lake, which you see here, that we are doing dust mitigation on. And then I mentioned on the Colorado River, we're in danger of shortages for the first time in its history. And then just the rising cost of wholesale water is a risk for the city as well. So the long-term solution to some of these problems that I just talked about is development of additional local water supplies. So here's some of our strategies for doing that. On the upper left, you see recycled water that's being spread into our groundwater basin. Uh, it's commonly referred to uh, as groundwater replenishment. And we've got a project to do that. In the center there, you see stormwater capture, where you capture volumes of stormwater, you infiltrate it into your groundwater basin, and then you're able to pump that water and serve it to your customers. And the far right is really one of the best resources, the cheapest ones we have, and that's conservation. It's always going to be your cheapest resource is the water that you don't use. And uh, the more that you can get people to use water efficiently and use less, that means you need to develop less and import less. But you can see that the stormwater and the recycled water are really dependent upon uh, having a groundwater basin that you can use. It doesn't make a lot of sense to make big investments in recycled water and stormwater to recharge a contaminated basin that you can't pump because it's contaminated. So we've got to get that groundwater basin remediated. And that project is going to go forward. And uh, it's about a $600 million project, so we're, uh, we've got uh, plans to do that. So a little more on each of these initiatives, the water conservation. I've mentioned some of the uh, rebate programs, but we also have ordinances in place uh, to achieve those conservation goals. We do a lot of public outreach. And then we also have partnerships. Uh, we work closely with other major stakeholders, other cities, other state agencies, and the private sector even, uh, the department association, some of the golf industry, we work very closely with them on water conservation. Our local uh, stormwater capture, it's kind of two things about stormwater capture. On the left here you see these large stormwater capture projects. These are large flood control dams where you capture uh, large volumes of stormwater and then you meter that water out into the spreading basins and you see there are, are Tonga spreading grounds. 
On, the, on, your, left, on your right hand side, you see uh, cisterns, rain gardens, rain barrels. These are more distributed projects that are neighborhood level projects where you're capturing water in the neighborhood in, on people's residential property. You're either offsetting their potable uses as with a cistern or you're trying to get that water into the ground. The San Fernando Groundwater Basin, as I mentioned, this is, uh, you can see the map there that gives you a feel for what the San Fern how big the San Fernando Basin is. Uh, you see the Santa Monica Mountains and uh, you, everybody in Los Angeles kind of knows where the valley is, but you get across the Santa Monica Mountains, you're into the ground to the San Fernando Valley and that entire valley is really uh, underlies our, overlies our groundwater basin and that's our biggest resource. But we've got contamination problems there. There are legacy contamination from industry that has put uh, primarily uh, vault or organic carbons into that groundwater basin, uh, trichloroethylene, perchloroethylene. We've got plans to pump that water and treat it and remediate that basin. And that will allow us to recharge that basin with recycled water, with storm water, and uh, to fully utilize our adjudication in that basin. Okay, this is another picture of our water supply future. And what this really shows you is a snapshot looking forward to where we want to go. On the left, you see a pretty heavy dependence upon wholesale water purchases. And on the right, you see more of a diversified portfolio with a pretty dramatic reduction in those purchases. So uh, it's going to take a lot of investment. It's going to take some time. But this is the direction that the department wants to go, to have a more diverse water supply that will be more sustainable for the future. And this is the future. These pictures here, you know, you, you would think that with all the water conservation that we want to do and with the restrictions we want to put uh, on wasteful uses that people may end up living in a desert, but, that, but that's not the case. There's a lot of California friendly plants that uh, are really beautiful, that don't require as much uh, water as your traditional turf does, and so this is really a cultural change that we're seeking to facilitate with people through incentives uh, to convert over from more uh, water intensive lawns type landscape to more California friendly landscapes like you see here. And I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. Thank you. I'm a teacher in the San Fernando Valley. Wonderful. And my students are researching solutions to water shortage problems in LA. And one of the students asked me today, how do you clean up a polluted groundwater system, aquifer? Okay. And, and I want more details then. We're going to pump the water out and sure. treat it. Well, um, you saw one of the slides, and maybe I can back up to it, and I can give you a little more detail on what you're looking at. So here what you see on the, you see the picture of the groundwater basin, and then you see to the right of that, you see some treatment facilities. So what these treatment facilities do is essentially it's uh, granulated, granulated activated carbon, so GAC filters, which are really effective in removing volatile organic carbons, and that's primarily what the contamination in the San Fernando Basin is. But there are other contaminants in that basin as well. And so what we're going to be doing is building a large centralized treatment facility, which will remove not only VOCs, but other contaminants that are in that groundwater basin. And there are various uh, mechanisms that you can uh, put in place that will treat that water as it comes out of the ground. These are just some of the methods that we're currently using, but there are other methods that we're going to be using, but it's going to require uh, like I said, a $600 million investment in a large treatment facility. Really what you have to do is you just have to um, accept the fact that that groundwater basin is going to probably remain contaminated. And so to utilize the basin, you're going to have to actually treat the water as you bring it out of the basin. And you're going to have to probably treat all the water that comes out of that basin. So that's really where we're at now. Right now we've 
I had to shut down uh, over a half our wells uh, in the San Fernando Valley due to contamination. And uh, we're in the process of moving forward with that treatment facility. Sorry, so when the water gets treated, where does it go? It goes into the distribution system. So once it's treated to meet all uh, federal and state drinking water standards, it goes into the distribution system and is served to the customer. And so let's say that we take the water out and treat it and send it to the houses and businesses. And, and then it rains and the aquifer gets recharged. And you're telling me that no matter how much water we pump out, it's always going to be contaminated? Well, over time, you'll remove a lot of the contaminants, but it's going to take a very long time. It took uh, many years to contaminate the basin. It's going to take many years to get the contaminants out of the basin. But y what you just described is exactly what happens. And uh, there are safe yield uh, requirements for all groundwater basins, for most groundwater basins. Certainly all of our uh, groundwater basins have been fully adjudicated. Uh, which means there are safe yield uh, requirements in those basins, and so you're not allowed to overpump the basin, which uh, you know really causes various problems in other parts of the state. You've heard about those problems, but uh, we are under uh, certain adjudicated requirements on how much we can pump, and those are uh, based on safe yield. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I'm also a teacher at, uh, in LA USD, teaching sixth grade. I have a question regarding the LA River. Um, I saw a documentary, Rock the Boat, where people actually navigated down the river. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and in the documentary, they mentioned there's enough water supply that goes down to the ocean into our watershed system to actually um, uh, t to meet the demand for, for the uh, the Los Angeles community. So is there any plan for the city to capture the water that's going down our cemented LA River? Yeah, that's a good question. It relates to our plans for stormwater capture. And you've heard that, well, you know, if we could capture all the storm water that fell in the city of Los Angeles, we could, we could uh, meet a lot of the city's demands. Well, we do have, we actually just finished last year a stormwater capture master plan for the city of Los Angeles. Uh, currently, uh, we capture about 60,000 acre feet of stormwater, and that's through incidental recharge, that's natural recharge like you described, but also through our centralized and distributed stormwater capture uh, investments that we've made. Uh, we've got plans to either double or triple that uh, between now and uh, 2040. So we, we've got some plans in place to try to increase it dramatically, but we've got a city that the demands are about 550,000 acre feet a year. And currently, we're capturing, through various means, about 60,000 acre feet a year. We want to double or triple that, so maybe we could get up to 180,000 acre feet a year of uh, stormwater capture overall. But uh, we're still going to need other uh, sources of water. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, well, I want to thank you all again for taking the time to be here. I know this has been a long presentation, and uh, I'll be here for a little while. If you want to get my business card, I'm happy to give it to you. And you can call me if you have questions later, or if there are things that you would like, uh, I'd be happy to accommodate you. So uh, thank you again very much for taking the time out of your evening to be here at the LADWP. We really appreciate it.